I love the way that there's so many um, sort of user land experiments in different um, ways of using flux and the ideas and lots of lots of great ideas that are coming from all over the place and there's a few common themes through all of them and you know we're getting there I think with all of this surrounding stuff I think GraphQL and Relay are going to make a big difference but thank you very much for that it's great okay um, I th shall we carry on or should we have a break I think we'll carry on we've got two short talks um, left one's Robbie McCorkle and one from James Dello so let's let's move on Yeah, we can go ahead. OK, well, hi, everyone. I'm Robbie. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, I'm a developer at Red Badger. Um, and as Joe said, um, we've had a huge amount of feedback just saying, like, more React Native. We just want to know more about React Native. So I thought I'd just come up and show, like, a quick thing that I've been playing around with, just like 10 minutes, just a sort of lightning talk kind of thing. Um, so. Uh, Last time I was here, I gave like a really quick sort of intro talk to React Native, purely because I'd managed to get my grubby hands on it uh, early. Um, and, uh, and then about maybe a month afterwards, I gave the sort of the same talk um, to a group of iOS developers here at Facebook. Um, and it turned out to be sort of a trickier task than I thought. Like, I thought I could just reuse the same talk again. But my talk was kind of focused around, hey, we're web developers, and finally we can write native apps, and we don't have to learn anything new. Hooray. Uh, which doesn't really work for iOS developers, especially as ComponentKit had just come out at that point. Um, and ComponentKit in Objective-C or C++ has a lot of these similar advantages. Like it's componentized, it's got CSS kind of styling. Um, so it was a bit of a harder sell. So I, I was forced to look up some other kind of interesting aspects of React Native um, that I thought these guys would be interested in. And cross-platform code was one of them. So I'll walk you through that really quickly. Um, so as we all know, JavaScript runs on anything, right? Um, so this should be a pretty easy thing to do. As long as our JavaScript doesn't have any dependency on the, the, the DOM or, or React itself, then in theory, we can run it anywhere. So I created a really quick React Native demo app uh, for you. Uh, let me just make this a bit bigger. Maybe a little bit too big. Oh, command two. There you go. Um, interestingly, Facebook's Wi-Fi seems to have dumped me in Sweden, or Denmark even, um, when this is supposed to be homing in on this office, but never mind. So the idea behind this app is it's just the, the native uh, map view, just to prove once again that we are all native. Uh, and when you scroll through the map view, it gets a new coordinates, it pulls a quick API uh, for the weather, and it shows you the weather at the center of the map. Um, it's pretty simple. But I can show you that code. So we go to Atom, make that a bit bigger. Nice. Um, and here we go. So we go to iOS. So this is bit like Joe just showed, it's like it's a React Native app. It's all piled into just one file. I haven't bothered splitting it out too much. Um, and it's really, really simple. So we're just sort of requiring in all of the stuff we need at the top, um, extracting it all out. We've got some initial states to set our defaults, blah, blah, blah. And a few helper functions for our, uh, for our component. But probably the most important thing that you need to know is this map view. So that's a wrapper, React Native wrapper around the native map view. Um, and it's got this event on it saying on region change complete. So when the person stops scrolling, it's going to give us a new uh, set of coordinates for where the map is sat. Um, and it calls this function called on region changed, which is up here, which calls a function called get weather. And get weather does the API communication. And when the API comes back, it sets a state with a new weather information loads the page again. All good. Um, this API bit here is a little bit that I extracted out into another file. It's just called API, imaginatively. Uh, and I put it in here. So this has got just a couple of little helper functions. And the get weather function is using fetch, since that's becoming ubiquitous across platforms now. 
Um, you need to use some polyfills right now, but it will be everywhere. Um, and it's nice and simple. But obviously, the crucial thing is that this is just a raw JavaScript file exporting an object. There's no dependency on React and things like that. Um, so how can we use this on another platform? Well, I don't have access to the Android version of React Native yet, although, as Joe says, I think that might be coming soon. Um, so for want of a better platform, I've used the web. Um, so I made a little quick demo app for the web. It's doing the same kind of thing. Um, this one has honed in on this office, which is good. And we can scroll around London and see that it's bloody hot at the moment. Um, and I can show you the code for that as well. So you can see in Atom here, maybe if it's not too small, that uh, we've got a native folder with all of the iOS code in. And I've actually surrounded that with all of the web code. Um, and here's the component for the web app, which is pretty similar to what we saw before. We've got some initial state with some defaults in. We've got those helper functions again. We've got a render function. But this time, we're using the Google Maps API to show the map, obviously, because we don't have the uh, iOS native map view. Um, that just happens to have a similar function called it on center changed. So uh, when that's called, uh, we call the get weather function. And hooray, we're calling that same file again, API. Uh, I'm importing it from the top here, uh, straight from the same place the native app was, right there. So now we're using the same code in two places. You know, brilliant. We can start sharing logic. Um, but there's one more thing. Uh, obviously, no React app today is complete without being isomorphic. Um, so obviously, I had to get this all running on the server as well. Um, I can prove that if I turn off JavaScript here. Then we've got the same thing. We can't move the map around. It's just a static image. Uh, but we've got the temperature for where we are right now. Um, so I can show you how that works in my routes running on Node. Um, here, I haven't actually been too clever. I haven't done any IP sniffing or anything like that. I've just hard coded in the location for this office. Um, but you guessed it, there's that API function again. Uh, so we're importing that. Um, it's in the same place. So now we've got the same code running in V8 on Chrome, uh, on Node, and in, what is it, JS Core on iOS. Um, because it's just JavaScript, right? JavaScript runs everywhere. Um, so how can we sort of move this out? Obviously, this is a really simple application. Um, so if I go back to Keynote here, I can show you my pretty dodgy uh, diagram of Flux, which is a bit like the one we saw earlier. So you got your component tree. Uh, your component tree needs to say pretty dumb, ideally. Um, and your component tree is hydrated in data by your Flux stores. Um, which on the web, you hydrate from your server side, talking to the API. Um, and this is a kind of representation of your one-way data flow. So your components may be at the bottom of your tree or wherever in your tree you can call an action. Your action can do some logic, almost like an MVC structure, but with one-way flow. Um, and it might talk to an API, get some new data. It might dump that data on a dispatcher event, um, you know, a JavaScript event, store picks it up, creates new data, pumps it back into your component tree, which is all great for the Flux architecture. But um, the most important thing about this is that all the stuff highlighted in green actually has nothing to do with React, really. Um, it's just plain old JavaScript. Um, it's just a pattern, right? We keep saying, like, Flux isn't a library. It's just a pattern. So it's just JavaScript. Um, so if you were to extend this application out a little bit further and make it more complicated, um, you could make it a Flux application and, in theory, share your entire Flux pattern across, uh, across platforms. So in the end, if you keep your applications nice and simple, um, keep it tidy in your Flux architecture, if you build it once, you build it on the web or whatever, uh, you should, in theory, be able to build your native app much, much faster than you would usually. Not least because the React Native experience in development is nice and quick, but you've actually done a hell of a lot of the work already. You've built your API, you've built your actions, you've built your stores, you've built your dispatcher and your event loop and everything like that. All you need to do is switch out this bit, just the component tree. 
and have it use all the same data. And yeah, maybe you'll have some, some other things, maybe a couple of stores that are uh, specific to your, your particular platform, but hopefully you can keep most of it generic. So anyway, there's something for you to go home and play with. I think it's quite an interesting uh, part of React Native that hasn't really been talked about very much. Um, and hey, this isn't new, right? This Xamarin has had this kind of cross-platform code thing for a while, but it's certainly something that we can add to the list of advantages of React Native. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to see what people build with that kind of thing. Thanks. <laughs>